I had to give a lot of thought how to clip this down to one minute. Can't tell the story in La Jolla about my son proposing to Brenda a few, quite a few years ago. It's a wonderful story, I'll tell it later. When I moved here and just five years ago, just in time to get ready for the flood. And uh, after the flood, we got really embroiled as a family, three generations talking about changing or adding a new uh, ordinance of, in front of the Boulder City Council. And, and I can remember in the conference room at Alfalfa shooting videos of the little kids uh, talking about how we ought to be protecting the bears. That's what you're going to hear about today. And uh, it's been a, uh, quite an experience. And uh, now uh, both Brenda and Bob, my son, are involved in the... Uh, new Reality Garage VR business in which they're going to do a lot of good with that too. But Brenda got a very good start on the Boulder Bear Coalition and here she is. Hi, um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, so I'm Brenda Lee, thank you Wayne. Um, and I have lived here in Boulder, Colorado for about 12 years. And um, this guy right here, I didn't know we had black bears in Boulder. I grew up in California and lived in San Diego for 20 years before moving here. And I quickly learned uh, that we have black bears and mountain lions regularly cruising through our alleyways and streets. So, um, and one thing is I have found out bears love hammocks. So just, if you do a Google search, bears and hammocks, you will find tons of videos, especially cubs. They just love hammocks. So I um, started the Boulder Bear Coalition, and um, so today I'll just give background on, on why I started it, what we do, what we're continuing to do, and um, how the community here in Boulder has really um, come together to help protect wildlife in our community. Um, we're, we are a nonprofit, and our mission is to use uh, proactive solutions to keep bears safe. So first of all, just to give a little bit of background, um, and I'll just go through these quickly. So um, these are black bears, yet Clearly, they come in all different colors. And I've even seen a uh, blonde, very blonde one in the wild. Um, so most of the black bears that we see in town do look like the, the guy down at the bottom. But we do have quite a few cinnamon-colored and lighter brown bears as well. And a lot of times people ask, and probably everyone lives here, so you, I mean, you probably already know this, but they are not grizzlies. Grizzlies are considered the, are the brown bears, and we have black bears. We used to have grizzlies years ago, but uh, we haven't had grizzlies in, I, I don't know, maybe 100 years. Um, so the, this is kind of hard to, it, they're not really next to each other size-wise, grizzlies are quite a bit bigger. But really, the, the factor that defines them is the hump on the back um, and uh, prominent ears and, and things like that. So history of Boulder Bear Coalition. So what I had found out uh, was that bears were killed every year in Boulder, and the community was really angry about this. Um, this is a bear, actually, that we... I. Um, spent some time with a couple years ago um, in, in uh, Chautauqua area. So um, I, the community, I was asking people, well, uh, why are the bears being killed? And the answer I got over and over was, whatever you do, don't call Department of Wildlife because they will kill the bears. And um, I found that really interesting because there was no solution. It was just a us versus them. Whatever you do, don't call them, keep it a secret. And so I wanted to understand why this was. 
So I became a bear sitter. So there's um, city bear sitters, and it used to be Department of Wildlife. Now it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, they merged with um, parks and recreation um, a few years ago. So I became a CPW uh, bear sitter. And the reason I did is because I wanted to understand on my own why um, they were killing bears and what the management protocol was, rather than jumping on that bandwagon of they're the bad guys. Um, yes, they're the ones with the guns, but that doesn't mean that they're, they're bad guys. So um, I was really impressed by their training program. And um, ironically, I actually started to really respect what they were doing and why they were here. And instead started to look at the city and trying to understand why we were calling in CPW officers in the first place to deal with bears. And really what became very clear to me was that we had a very reactive management style of um, dealing with bears in town. So when bears came into town, the city's number one priority is to protect the community. And so they would call in CPW officers to, do, to fill that role. And um, so my question was, well, why are the bears here? Like, let's not talk about like pointing the finger at the person taking the bear down, but why are the bears here in the first place? And I felt that the city and the community wasn't doing enough to, um, to ensure that, so that the bears don't have to be here, we don't have to worry about it being a public um, safety issue. And the other thing was really defining the roles. So the role of CPW, protect people from wildlife. Um, the role of the city, that is when they were coming into town, they were protecting people from the bears or mountain lions that are in town. Role of the city was really to set and enforce policy. So that was another piece I was going to start looking at is what's the policy. Um, and that it was reactive. So they're typically very shy. They're big, but they're very shy. So why are they here? That was the question I want to answer. They're hungry. <laughs> so, I know it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so, they, um, they need to eat uh, about 20,000 calories a day um, be it during the pre-hyperphagia period, before they or during hyperphagia, before they go into hibernation. So, starting in about August, they start to bulk up, and all they're thinking about is eating. And so... They're also opportunists. And so what I found, I started talking to people, and what do you know? There was trash everywhere. Um, and so this is an alley in Uni Hill. I could tell you which, ad, you know, the, which streets, when the bears hit it, which streets, because they know the trash schedule. And I got to know the trash haulers, and they would say, oh, yeah, Thursday mornings, you need to go down these alleys. On Friday mornings, go down these. And um, so I spent a lot of time in the um, alleys looking at trash and documenting that. Um, it's amazing what a master's degree will do. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's a car. If any of you have seen a car, when a bear gets in, bears can get into cars. They can't get out. So um, it's, and they will destroy the car. And then it's interesting trying to get the bear out, who's very mad, and um, to do that safely. In fact, it just happened a couple of weeks ago up in um, Jamestown, I think. So. So, um, so really the problem is that the bears come into town because they're hungry. We are basically leaving out a red carpet for them. Like here there's trash and, um, and then we kill them. And I say we, because I really do believe it's a, it's a community problem and that it's, um, not taking responsibility for that if we're just allowing reactive management. So um, bears become considered nuisance bears even if all they're doing is eating. They're not being aggressive, they're not doing anything um, that, that feels like they're gonna hurt anybody, and typically they're not, but you don't, I wouldn't wanna run into one in the alley, but, um, 
So they be, they're considered nuisance bear. So a nuisance bear has to be dealt with. First thing the city does is they call in um, bear sitters. So we'll go, we have a list of 30 bear sitters. We're on call and um, we'll go and hang out with the bear, keep it up in the tree. And because they're typically sleeping in a tree when, when they're seen. Um, and then we leave and it's like magic. They disappear and run up to open space. And you've been watching this 300 pound bear all day and you have four people there and no one saw it come down. I mean, they're really um, very quick and they don't want to be around people. And we do that so they don't come down and run across Broadway and um, get into, tr into trouble. So um, some of the bears that are considered nuisance, if they stay in town and they're just too comfortable being in town, they find a nice cozy ditch to hang out with and apple trees in people's yards, they have no reason to leave. We also find that a lot of female bears with young cubs are the ones that often find refuge in town and we're trying to figure out why that is. Um, so some of those bears, they, if it's safe to do so, they will tranquilize the bear and take the bear 50 miles away um, and give it a chance to become more of a wild bear. And um, what's important about that is that it typically doesn't work. Sometimes it does with a male bear who's looking for territory anyways, a young uh, juvenile bear, that often will work. You put them far away, they'll go somewhere else. But the mama bears and the cubs typically come back within a couple of weeks and they come right back to the spot where they were re relocated from. And um, an interesting story, there was a 610 pound bear, this was five years ago, was moved up to the border of Wyoming, CPW wants to be clear, it was on the Colorado side, um, and they have to get permission from rangers, whoever oversees wherever they drop off a bear, because they don't want a problem bear. So there has to be an exchange of, you know, what's the bear done in town? Why are you dropping it off in my jurisdiction? So this bear was allowed to be dropped off. He had jaw surgery in Fort Collins on his way. So he had been tranquilized, sedated, dropped him off. Within three weeks, that bear was back in South Boulder. So, I mean, they just, it's, they, got, they got the GPS in their head and they want to go back to where it was safe. So that's why relocation typically just isn't a good option. Um, so, but if they do relocate the bear, so if they have to handle that bear for whatever reason, touch, put hands on that bear and move it or do whatever they're going to do with it, they get a green tag. And this is bear 317. So they get a tag with a number and Boulder, the tags are green. So then they'll know if like this bear ended up in Evergreen, they'd know it's a uh, Boulder bear um, if they couldn't see the number. So she got tagged for eating pears in a pear tree on Evergreen and 23rd with her cubs. They moved them, they came back. She continued eating fruit. She chased someone on a bike. Um, that was kind of her last call. So um, the second time a bear has to be touched, um, they're euthanized. So she was euthanized. She had two cubs. And they were going to euthanize them because they had touched them the first time to relocate. And part of the effort to Boulder Bear Coalition is to really, we have a very respectful relationship with CPW. And we talked about it and it made sense to, why not give those bears a chance? They were young. They probably won't make it through the winter, but let's give them a chance. Um, and they know for sure they both were sighted. Um, one, I think a year later, was hit by a car, but the other one had been seen. So they did survive the winter, which was a great um, sign. So that means if another mama has to be put down, her, it's better to give the cubs a chance. So those are the kind of things we're doing. It's like, let's think outside of the normal protocol and what can we do um, to protect the spare. So that's one of the cubs. Um, and so really it came down to, do we have a bear problem or do we have a human problem? I think we all know the answer to that. Um, so one of the things we've done is look at why the bears are in town. And you know, Boulder's built, we have, we have a beautiful donut of open space around Boulder. So occasionally a bear will come through town because it's looking for territory, that's, that's normal. Um, however, 
it's not really bear territory or it's not bear, um, it's not native bear land where we live here in Boulder. Um, I love this picture because this is the uh, same corner, Fifth and Pleasant. Really, Boulder was a flat grassland. So if a bear came down, it's really just moving through. And so that was the other issue. So if bears do come in, how do we keep them from wanting to stay? So even if they rambled in and they weren't hungry, but they find a big, beautiful tree and water and fruit, why would you leave? Um, so we looked at irrigation ditches um, to see patterns, and what do you know? That's where the bears are seen. Um, and so we started really looking at proactive management, and that's when we formed Boulder Bear Coalition, which was we really need to do change how things are happening and work with the city and the state to do so. So documented using Inquire Boulder um, to document trash, city council going to many, many city council meetings. Um, they wanted to know, well, how do you know it's a bear? So I got pictures of bear footprints in the snow, bear scat in the lower uh, right-hand corner, me looking now at your left hand, bear poop near the trash. So really just documenting for city council so that they can make an educated decision. Um, and besides the bear safety, I just thought if I was a parent coming and looking at CU with my students from out of Boulder, the alleyways were atrocious with rats and so that was part of my appeal was, you know, this isn't sanitary and we should be doing something about this anyways. So um, one of the things city council did not know, there's bear resistant trash cans that are fairly small, probably if you all live in Boulder. I'm sorry that you have to use a bear resistant trash can if, um, but it's, it, we worked with uh, West, uh, City of Western. I bought a $5,000 worth of trash cans so I could sell them to people, brought them to city council to show them. Um, so again, a lot of it was um, informing them. So we have the Boulder Bear, um, we have, excuse me, the Bear Protection Ordinance, which a large part of Boulder uh, has to use bear resistant trash carts. It's the largest in any state anywhere um, that I'm aware of. Uh, we're looking at expanding it um, to further east. And um, we have seen a difference. Now, there's many things that are going to correlate to why bears are in town. If there's a good fruit year up in the mountains or not, um, there, there's many factors. So we can't attribute fewer ba bears having to be killed to this. But we know this has helped. Um, and then the other piece was enforcement. No law is uh, worth its weight in anything unless it's enforced. So I came down pretty hard on that because I was still spending 20 hours a week documenting trash and after all that with the law being passed unanimously. So that's no longer a problem, which I am so thankful for uh, code enforcement. They've been amazing. Now, I, this is a video. I don't know if it'll show. Yeah. What do I do? Just click it? No. Nah. It's okay. It's not. It's fine. It's fine. We don't have to do it. It should be right a link right in there. Uh, it's okay. Um, I'll have it on my website. So we'll just move to the next one. What it was was we have um, a lot of trail cams around town or people send us pictures. So it was a bear um, trying to get into one of the bear resistant trash carts. And it's just really interesting. They're really working hard. Um, and as CPW said, if a bear is given enough time and hungry, it will figure it out. So, um, but it, it's really hard to get it open because it is bear resistant, not bear proof. Um, oh, in this picture, so bears love fruit. Um, crab apples are like bonbons for bears. And um, so that was the other thing we looked at. There's fruit trees all over Boulder, the old apple orchards. Um, in my neighborhood, I live in Newlands, you know, lots of big, old, beautiful apple trees. So in this map, I don't have the other map, but the map from the city, they have um, where the bear sightings are, pretty much as overlaps this. So um, Boulder Bear Coalition with five other 
four other nonprofits. We formed Community Fruit Rescue, and we do neighborhood harvesting. We get neighbors together. We supply all the supplies, a bunch of volunteers, and we help harvest um, apples. This is at one house, and this was probably about half of the apples. And then we divided a third to the homeowner, um, a third to the volunteers, and a third to um, organizations such as um, Boulder Food Rescue. So they bring it to the homeless shelter. BVSD has used some apples for applesauce. And then I have a weekly trek up to uh, Wild Animal Sanctuary and bring all the apples that are non-human consumptive but are good for bears and bring it out to the bears out there. And they know when the trucks come in, uh, they said that they just love those apples. So it's share the wealth. So we all have different reasons why we're part of the community fruit rescue, but it really came to, it's come together really nicely. Um, now this, so baby bears, just, I'll just go over this really quick. So I know, um, I want to leave time for Q and a, um, a lot of people have asked me in the past, why not bring the fruit up to the mountains and feed the bears, especially in a freeze when we know there's not a lot of fruit up in the mountains. And the answer is that, um, a, a female bear is impregnated in the spring, summer sometime. And then when she goes into hibernation, those um, eggs are, don't implant until she goes into hibernation. And depending on how healthy her body is, she will either abort all three or all, th I say three. Typically, a bear will wake up with zero to three bear cubs, a female bear. So she could have all those aborted or th all three will implant and she'll wake up with three cubs. So if we, if we mess with nature, I know we're already messing with nature, but um, by providing food, we're potentially going to create a bigger problem. And so we just need to let nature do its thing. Um, female bears will often survive a very bad fruit year, and she will go into hibernation very hungry and thin, but she will wake up and be healthy, but without cups. So... Um, that's why. However, we also partnered with Open Space and Mountain Parks to um, plant uh, a native food buffer. So we, they supplied the plants and some help, and we had volunteers. So we've done this two years in a row now to plant choke cherries, wild plum, currants, um, rose. There's several, um, which is native. And it's in areas where the flood had wiped out natural areas. So this way, if they're cru we looked at where it looked like a good bear corridor, that they would just stop and eat berries instead of coming all the way into town. And we have trail cams up there, and we've already had um, bear activity this year. Um, in that area. And on the left was last year, it was 80 degrees. On the same exact day this year, it was snowing. So, but all our volunteers showed up. It was fun. And then this one, probably we can't show it. This is from the trail cam up there of a bear um, coming up to the camera. So we've seen, and for OSMP, we're collecting data on what animals we see up there. So we've seen fox, um, bears, And then we're going to start to look to see if we can identify if it's the same bear. Um, so fox, bear, turkeys, vulture, turkey, yeah, and vultures. We haven't seen any mountain lions or bobcats in this particular area. Okay, so that was that. Um, well, there should be one other. Do you see a slide between that one? No? Okay. Okay. So um, one thing I just wanted to point out that's been really critical that we're working on right now is one, we're looking at livestock and electric fencing and what the policy is around that. Um, and because a lot of these things, people want, just want to do the right thing and they don't know that there's options out there. So that's where we've really focused on that solution aspect of it is helping brainstorm with people. And um, at the state level, we've gotten more and more involved at the state level with CPW policy um, about how wildlife is managed in Colorado. And there was a, a study passed last year that we were... Um, 
not fond of, and um, there's more work to be done on that. So with that, it's we feel, Boulder Bear Coalition, as well as a lot of other groups, that the CPW Commission that makes policy decisions um, is really outdated. It's not reflective of the representation of the constituents of Colorado. Um, it's very heavily weighted towards hunters and livestock owners, which absolutely have a place at the table, um, but that doesn't represent um, all of Colorado and what we want to see for the future of coexistence. Um, and, and coexistence is not animals cruising through our backyards. It's how can they live in the wild and we respect their, their place. Um, so that's something we're working on. I think the whoever is elected as governor is going to be key uh, because a governor uh, selects who is on that commission. It's also lacking um, in scientific rigor on some of the studies they've done. So what I'd like to see is what we've done in Boulder on this collaborative, let's work with city and state and community, um, not against each other, but with each other to at a state level do the same thing to really reflect what the what the people of Colorado want and um, so that's what we're currently working on um, we have more things in Boulder but we're also just focused on state level so that was it so um, thank you so much for having me and and does anyone have any questions whether there is an uh, alternative to the two strikes policy. I mean, I've never heard anybody talk about that in my years here. Um, I have, a lot of people have looked into or talked about it. My opinion and is that it wouldn't make a difference. If they said four strikes, it wouldn't matter because when they handle that bear the first time, it's based, the, its chance of survival is it, that bear is probably going to go down and so because it's a bear that has been handled chances are moving it won't help it's going to come back and it's going to be considered a nuisance bear so it's just a mortality for that bear I, so to push that uh, regulation legislation to change that i think would be um there wouldn't be enough bang for the buck <laughs> right i just i don't think it would make a difference yeah. So what is it about handling the bear that causes that? It's, it's not so much handling the bear, but the fact is CPW puts a lot of thought into whether they should handle the bear. They don't want to. So if that bear has to be touched, it's because that bear has been hanging out and it's not going away. It's not showing extreme fear of people. Um, even if it's just hanging out in a tree, but um, it's just they can't get, haze it back to open space. It's basically found Boulder as its home, someone's backyard as their home. So it's more that. So if they have to move it, chances are it's, yeah, it's going to be coming back. How is the Boulder Bear Coalition funded? A lot of hard work. <laughs> um, you know, and that's one thing that we haven't, we need to do better at fundraising. That has not been one of my strengths or background or anything. So we've, I've funded it, self-funded it. Um, we have volunteers that um, work to get things done. We've applied for some grants, but in actually in the city have not been successful. Again, it'd be great if we had a grant writer and a fundraiser, then I think what we could do would be so much more. Um, and I work full time, so it's like, this is my side project. And um, yeah, but if you know anyone who <laughs> want to help out, it'd be great. Brenda, yes. uh, I think we've, uh, we get the last word here at Boulder oh, Rotary, okay. so, and we run out of time, unfortunately, okay. this fascinating topic. Okay. And, uh, you may know that James Rollins said, always respect Mother Nature, especially when she weighs 300 pounds and is guarding her baby. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you for your fascinating presentation. And uh, I hope somebody in this club will step up and offer to, Help Boulder Bear Coalition, which has done an amazing things in spite of the fact that we had to get a new trash can. But, but in, in uh, 
and Bold, uh, Rotary International uh, took on Mother Nature uh, 26 years ago in the decision to try to eliminate the scourge of polio from the face of the earth. And we are very close. Uh, and, and we hope to, that that will happen in, in the next few years. And in your honor for help, for coming here and presenting to us today and for telling us what you did for, with, with and for Mother Nature, we would like to uh, contribute 100 doses of vaccine in your name. Thank you. Thank you.